right, everybody. Well, welcome. Thanks for joining us this evening. I'm Lori Cohen. I am one of the counselors, and I'm here with my colleague, Paul Bryant. Um, Mr. Bryant is going to be, while I'm presenting, Mr. Bryant <clears throat> is going to be answering your questions that you might have um, on the computer. So, Mr. Bryant, you don't have to interrupt talking. You can just uh, type and answer your questions as you go. Um, for people who have joined us, we're glad to have you. If you see below, there is a section that says Q&A. That's where we're going to have you write any questions that you might have. And as I said, Mr. Bryant will be answering them. And then at the end of the evening, we can spend a few more minutes answering anything that you haven't been addressed. Um, hopefully you were able to join us for our first session back in December. This is a continuation of that. And we'll go into a little more details as to what you and your students should be doing at this particular time. So here's our agenda for the evening. We are going to be spending some time talking about the college search process itself, um, how to do it, what to do, and so forth, what you can be actually working on now as a junior, and what you can be doing as a senior year. And then we'll touch a little bit on financial aid for you because everybody's that's a hot topic for everyone. So first of all, you should make sure you know who your student's counselor is. Um, here are students you guys should absolutely know since we've just finished meeting with you over the last few weeks for course selection. But here is the alphabetical last name breakdown for who your counselor is. And um, these are the people who will be helping get you through the college process. So the actual process itself is a very daunting one. There are over 3,000 colleges and universities in the United States alone that you want to narrow down to a very manageable, usable list for when you're applying. So lots to consider as you're thinking about your process. How do I narrow it down? So here are some of the topics and things that you and your students should be conversing with and discussing. Um, first of all, you want to look at, make sure that you are applying to schools that fit you in your range for your GPA and your um, major and your SAT scores if you plan on taking them. You obviously need to consider tuition, room, board, and fees. Um, schools can range from, you know, a few thousand dollars for a community college all the way up to, I just saw something online posted that University of Southern California is going to be close to like $89,000 next year. So there's a large range of schools. I do always suggest that you have this conversation with your students now about the finances. So if you are not in a position that it's realistic to apply to a school that's going to run you fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars, um, you want to talk to your students about that and have a conversation about the loans and so forth. Um, it, you want to do this now because if your student gets into his or her dream school and then you can't afford it and you've never talked about it with them, that can be heartbreaking. So we do encourage you to talk to the students and your spouse and your other people in the family to talk about how you're going to be able to afford and what you are realistically comfortable paying for. Um, size of school ranges. You can pick, have a school with under 2,000 students up to 50, 60,000 students. So there are some benefits and some negatives to both large schools and small schools. So a large school obviously has the benefit of um, a wide variety of majors and job opportunities. They often have more um, internship availability. They have more activities that students can get involved in. They certainly have a wide range of, of majors and courses to take. Some of the negatives of a large school is that you can be in a class of 200, 300, up to 700 students. So if you are a student who needs to have that connection with your professor, um, a large school may not be that, that for place for you. Um, the negatives of a small school kind of fit that. You end up knowing everybody on campus. If you decide to change your major, it may be hard to find something that you're still interested in. Um, but the benefits are you might feel like you do get to know people if that's important to you. You have relationships with professors and so forth. So it's really kind of a, a good thing to start to think about and picture. You know, you want to make sure if you're considering a school like a Penn State that your student is going to be able to wake up on their own and go to class because many of their large classes are not going to take attendance. They're not going to note if your student is there. So they need to be pretty self-driven to be able to navigate a school like that. 
Um, large schools do like to say that it's easy to make a large school feel small. It's not easy to make a small school feel large. And there is some validity and truth in that. So really spend a little bit of time on that. Going along with that is your average class size of the college. Um, these statistics are available on their websites. So you want to see if it fits into with what would work best for your student. Obviously, geographic um, location and distance from home is really important. Are they looking for an urban campus? Do they want an urban campus that has a urban feel? Or are they looking for an urban campus that has a collegiate feel? Um, fortunately, we have two right in our area. Um, in Philadelphia, we have Drexel that is a much more urban feel. And we have Temple that once you get on Temple's campus, it actually feels very much like a college with the grass and the buildings all surrounding the quad and so forth. Um, you want to consider the distance from home. And many times students will say, I want to go really far away, which is great. But you also have to build in the fact that if you do go far away, to get home will involve um, airfare and will involve arranging and coordinating ahead of time. They're not going to be able to come home for a long weekend. Or if someone is sick, you're not going to be able to get to them or they're not going to be able to get to you. And often when college students are traveling is when airfares definitely raise their prices. So you need to build that into your factoring of the cost of the college as well. Are athletics and extracurriculars important to you, both either as a viewer or as a participant? Um, you want to look into that if you're interested in, for instance, Greek life. You want to make sure that the college is supporting that. If you're not interested in Greek life, you also want to make sure that that's not the only component of a school's social life. Um, the facilities and the housing, um, many colleges are doing tremendous building and they're putting a lot of energies in their housing and their dorm rooms and some of the like student unions and the, and the gyms. So that's something important to you. Make sure you're looking at that. Um, we talked about the tuition costs. I like to say the college is very similar to Kohl's, that not many people pay full price for the item. So colleges do release their average financial aid award for students. So that's something to look at as well. Obviously, if you're going in knowing exactly a, a major you want or a specific career path you're, you're pursuing, you want to make sure that the colleges you're looking at have that. Um, diversity is important. If you are looking for an HBCU, you would focus your thing on that. If not, you want to make sure that it's a diverse school or it's, it's all men, all women, whatever you're looking for, you need to consider if that's a component for you. And finally, special activities kind of goes along with the extracurriculars. For instance, if you have a student who is um, involved in, say, crew, you want to make sure that they have access to a river where they can do that particular activity. So other things to think about, and these are tend to be things that parents look at more than the students, um, is the statistics of the college. How many students return after freshman year and how many graduate in four years and how many graduate in six years? What is their job placement and their career center like? Do they have people available to help you with resume writing and interview skills? What's their graduate student school acceptance, if that's something you're interested in pursuing? Um, do they have career fairs where job fairs, where um, corporations and companies come to campus to recruit students, or is it more on your child's experience themselves? Um, advisory system, is it important to you that they have one advisor for the year, for their four years rather, then that's something you want to inquire about. Um, parking, are cars allowed to be there for students? And is there public transportation for them to get back and forth to you? And finally, new construction, how much new building are they doing? Is this going to impact your student's experience? And so forth. So lots and lots to think about as you pursue what kind of college experience you want. So how do you do this? Lots of searches out there. Um, one that is a good one, College Board has a nice one called Big Future, but we do subscribe to something called Naviance. So that's a really good place to start and keep track of things. So I'm going to spend some time tonight going over Naviance and how you can use it for the college search process. Um, when you are in the fall of your senior year, Naviance is where you're going to be requesting transcripts and letters of recommendation. But for your junior year, you're going to be use it to you can use it to do your research. So students can access their Naviance account. It's become much more simple. They basically go to Cheltenham.org, click on the high school and students, and click on Naviance. 
Then for the log on, all they have to do is click on the button that says continue with single sign on. And as long as they're doing it on their Chromebook, it is going to pull right into their Cheltenham um, act information and log them directly onto Naviance. They don't need to mess around with a username and password any longer. So where to start? On the home page, you will see a um, this top button, this top line up here, home, self-discovery, careers, college, and planner. So we're going to be working for tonight's purposes, basically in the colleges section. So I really like this super match college search. If you click on that, you're going to begin to be asked all kinds of questions on these topics here. And you answer the questions and you narrow down your searches, and then it will generate for you a list of colleges that fit the criteria you're interested in. You can save that and you can um, recreate and do a different search, but it's a really good way to start. Um, when you find a college that you like, you're going to add colleges to colleges I'm thinking about. Now, when you're working on Supermatch, and it's going to give you a list of colleges, you will see a little, a little empty heart next to the name of the college. If you click on that heart, it will automatically add it to your colleges I'm thinking about. So that's really a nice tool and a nice way to do that. Um, one thing that we do have in the fall that I really encourage students to take, in, take advantage of are college visits. So every fall, we have a good 50, 60 colleges that come to Cheltenham. They are the representatives from the school that are assigned to the Cheltenham School District. So these are the men and the women who will be reading your student's college application. It's a nice way to get some face time with them and to get them to meet and talk to you. So that's college visits where you'll see that here. So colleges I'm thinking about. Once you've added colleges to colleges I'm thinking about, you're going to get a screen that looks similar to this. And you're going to see the names of the schools that you've entered into colleges I'm thinking about. It'll um, be a hyperlink. So you can click on the name of the college and it will take you to information about the school, anything you can imagine, from what the major is, to the extracurriculars, to the financial costs, to the student population. It's a really nice way to get some basic information. Um, just to explain this CA or not CA, CA stands for common application. And I will talk more about that in a short while, but these are schools that are using the common application. Up in the upper right-hand corner, there's a button that says, compare me. Once you have entered schools into colleges I'm thinking about, you're gonna click on that compare me button and it's going to take you to this screen. And it's going to have your name here your current GPA, and your SAT or PSAT if you have taken them. And then it's going to show you statistics for Cheltenham students from the last seven to eight years who have applied to these schools and what their averages are. So for instance, if you look at the Commonwealth University, Bloomsburg, Lock Haven, and Mansfield, over the last eight years, um, if you all the way here on the right-hand side, you will see 124 students applied 80 have been accepted. That's what that number means. This is their average GPA. This is their average SAT scores. So you see this red X. That means that your GPA is lower than the average student who's accepted at Bloomsburg has been. Please keep in mind that this is one tool that's very useful because you do want to make sure that not all of your colleges are only red Xs. Um, for instance, if you look down here at Millersville, you see that their average SAT score is 1040. This student's average SAT or SAT score was 1050, so that's why it's a green check mark. Um, keep in mind that these red and green do not guarantee or acceptance or denial. Rather, it's one tool. So we don't know um, what else you are the colleges is, are looking for in terms of extracurriculars and essays and letters of recommendation. This is strictly based on GPA and SATs if they're applicable. Can parents log in to Naviance? So parents can log in. If they log in, um, I believe in the upper right-hand corner, there is a little circle that should have your students' initials. I believe you can click on that 
and add a parent. If that's not where it is, you can certainly email your counselor and we can do it from our screen very simply. We just need to activate your account, make sure you have the same email address. So have your student check that first in that little circle in the upper right corner, and that should take them to their account and there should be a place to add a parent. And if that does not work, please email your student's counselor and we can add you immediately. Great question. All right, so and it's really good to do research the colleges online and to look at their websites and so forth, but you wanna keep in mind that these websites are designed by PR folks. So they have found the best pictures, the best lighting, the best examples of what college life looks like. So I would warrant to bet that on most college websites, you're going to see a picture of kids sitting on the grass in their sweatshirts from the college, look reading books and talking and so forth. Those websites are great to look at, but it is really important to go actually visit the college, especially if it is within driving distance. Now, if you're applying to all schools in Florida or California or Texas, it certainly becomes much harder to visit a school and, and, and very costly without knowing if you're going to be accepted. So it's okay to wait on those. But if you're within a driving distance, we strongly encourage you to go visit the schools. Um, spring break, which is coming up in a few short, very short weeks, is a nice time. Um, summer is also a good time. You can take a day from school and go visit. We just ask that you email the attendance office ahead of time and that you provide them confirmation of a scheduled visit to the college and you'll be excused. So how do you visit a school? You're going to go onto their website and you're going to type in University of Pittsburgh visit. And it's going to take you to a place um, online where you can register for a visit. They typically offer visits and information sessions there back to back. So usually a visit is 40, is a tour is 40 to five minutes to an hour and an information session is 45 minutes to an hour. So you're looking about two hours on a campus for a bit general tour and information session. Really good to sign up on those. Some colleges do keep records of who uh, um, attends these college visits and visits them. So try not to do it on your own, but rather actually register with the college. Um, so for example, if we have two students who are applying to the college and they're very, very similar in terms of GPA and courses and extracurriculars and so forth, and one has visited and one has not, the colleges who keep track of visits are going to be more inclined to offer a spot to the student who's visited already because they know that you've seen the campus and you are truly interested. So make sure you're registering and not just doing a drive-by if at all possible. Um, many colleges in the spring have open houses for juniors. They can often fall during the weekends on a Saturday and they are an opportunity to spend a little more time. So they will have sessions for parents and for students. So you can learn about specific majors. You can learn about extracurriculars. You can learn about financial aid. Those tend to be longer in time frame. So you want to make sure you're, you know, you have this availability for that one. Um, when you're going on the tours, parents, I know we have a lot of questions as parents, but you really want to let your kids make drive this process. So try to hold yourself back from asking the questions. Let your kids ask the questions. Let your kids walk up ahead with the tour guide and you kind of hang back behind them. Um, I do also recommend whenever possible that once the tour is over, you break away and if time allows, maybe have a meal in the cafeteria or in the student hub or something like that. Because tour guides are hired. Some of them are paid students. Some of them are volunteers. But these are kids who tend to love their college and they love the school. So they also are going to do, be doing a really good sales pitch to you. So walk around on your own in addition. Have Grab a quick bite to eat in the hub or in the cafeteria. Watch the kids. Do you see yourself there? Would you look like these are kids who you would be friends with and want to hang around with? Are they all sitting by themselves or running, rushing in and out and not interacting? Or is it much more social? So it's a nice opportunity to do that as well. Um, some colleges often offer interviews and there are two types of interviews. One is an interview that is there for admissions purposes, which means that the person who is interviewing you is going to be writing up something about their, their interview with you and sharing it with the admissions council. And it will become part of your packet as they decide whether or not to accept you. 
Um, the other ones are just more informational and they are going to be just kind of to give you information. So either case, if they offer an interview, you should take it. Um, we like to say in this business that anything is optional that says optional is really not optional. We want you to do as much as you can to put yourself out there and, and sell yourself. So an interview would be a nice opportunity. Uh, you want to be prepared. You want to have done some research about the college. So you don't want to walk into the interview and say, so how many kids are on this campus? Because that's an easy fact you can learn on your own. But instead you might ask a question like, you know, I see that you have a career fair in the fall. How many students tend to get internships from there? Or what is your mock trial team experience like here at this school? So you want to be prepared, come with some questions, maybe practice ahead of time. Um, students, you do not want to have gum in your mouth. You don't want to be on your phone. You want to be present and engaged with the person who interviews you. And then when it is finished, make sure you get their business card and you write them a thank you note. Oftentimes, um, for the some of the more competitive schools, interviews are conducted by alumni, and oftentimes they will meet you at a Starbucks or do a Zoom call or something like that. So it's still appropriate to write a thank you note. Again, parents, this is time for your students. You should not be involved in this process in terms of sitting in with them. You can practice with them ahead of time, but you certainly do not want to be part of the interview unless they you are specifically invited to do so. All right, so you've now taken your mass number of colleges and you've narrowed it down to a very reasonable list. Um, so you might ask, what is a reasonable number of students, of applications that students apply to? Many students um, apply to, I would say an average is between seven and 10 schools. You wanna make sure that you have schools that fit on this range so you don't have all red and you also don't wanna have all green. So you want to make sure that you have a nice range of schools. So once you're applying, you need to know what the colleges are actually looking for. So here is what college admissions offices have said is their top criteria that they are interested in as they review applications. Number one, every single school that I have ever heard from or talked to, it's the grades and the GPA and college prep classes and um, the rigor of the courses that your student is taking. So if you have straight A's, but you've never taken an honors or an AP class, that could work against you. So if you have A's and B's and you've been in regular classes, it's time to start trying an honors or an AP class. Um, so that's really important to think about and make, hopefully you've had these conversations with your counselors, but if not, it's never too late to pop in and talk to us or email us about that. But that's a really important thing that colleges are looking for. Do be aware that when we send your transcript to colleges in the fall, you will not have senior grades done yet, but you will have sent to them a list of the classes that you are enrolled in as a senior. So you do need to keep this rigor and the demanding course load up for your senior year because that is really important to colleges. We will send um, mid-year grades, so first semester grades, to any college that requires them, and, and the good majority of schools do require them. So you also need to make sure that your senior year grades continue to be strong and on an upward trend. Um, standardized test scores. These would be your SATs and ACTs. We did spend a lot of time talking about them back in December, um, but many schools are still test optional from, for next year, although we are starting to see colleges start to require them again. Um, and I'm also seeing articles from colleges where Maybe last two years ago, 60% of kids did not send SATs. This year, it's down to 40%. So more and more students are using SATs, taking SATs and sending them. So absolutely, we encourage everybody to try the SATs or an ACT test at least once and see how you do. And if you think that it's possible to get those scores up to a good range, I would encourage you to try them. Um, after those scores, it kind of, all of these number three, four, and five kind of all blend together in terms of the order of what they're looking for. So the essay and a personal statements are, all, are certainly looked at if they are required. If teacher and or counselor recommendations are required, they are also utilized. And absolutely extracurricular involvement, volunteer work, and leadership. So colleges are not looking for students to jump in junior year and join um, four, five, six, seven new activities. 
hopefully you have been involved in activities along the way and you are just continuing them and maybe growing as as taking more of a leadership role and a um more a bigger role in the experience itself so types of applications that you're going to be using there are school specific applications so you would go directly to the college's website and apply through the college's website many schools especially schools that our kids tend to apply to are on the common application it's commonapp.org there are over 700 schools so common app is where you will fill out the basic demographic information one time you will submit you will upload a, your personal essay your personal statement to this then you will have to answer individual questions from the colleges but it's a really nice portal from where you can apply to all different to all your schools in one with one portal so most kids do use common app lots of choices for types of admissions opportunities so I'm going to just real quickly run through these regular decision means the college has a deadline so all applications have to be in by January 1st at midnight no application is looked at before January 1st after January 1st a committee will sit down and will begin reviewing all applications and um, make decisions and then often they are released all on the same day um, just for a fun fact today is pi day and 314 this is the date that MIT releases their decisions so they would fall under the regular decision op option um, then we have what's called rolling admissions these tend to be our state schools Kutztown Westchester Penn State Pittsburgh Temple Rutgers what that means is they are reviewing decisions as they come into their office so typically they try to say within four to six weeks after you make an application they will give you a decision um, understand that the earlier you apply in the fall the more likely it is that you're going to hear a decision early uh, we have students who apply to University of Pittsburgh when they open up their application Pittsburgh's very good at this in August they apply in August and they are um, given a decision in mid mid September so it does happen that for so if you have a college has let's just make it easy for you a thousand spots open in September they still have a thousand spots open so they can very quickly and not as many kids get their applications in in September so they have more time to review these applications they they can be a little more lenient you're more likely to be accepted in September than you will maybe November, December, January when they're down to 20 spots left. So they can be a little more picky. So if a college is enrolling in missions, we absolutely encourage you to apply by the end of September or middle to, of October at the latest. Then we have something called early action. Early action is a set deadline. It's typically middle to end of October. So October 15th, October 30th sometimes October 1st, November 1st. Um, and anybody who applies by that date will be reviewed and decisions are made typically by end of December or mid-January. Um, some colleges tie their awarding of grants and merit money into early action applicants. So if a school offers an early action application, we absolutely encourage you to take advantage of that date and make sure you're submitting your application by the early action date early action rolling admissions and regular decision even if you get your decision in September you technically do not have to give the colleges an answer until the national acceptance day which is May 1st so you can have a decision in September but you don't have to decide until May 1st if you're waiting to hear from others or want to see what the money situation is or so, what so forth early decision option is not that way so an early decision means you are entering into a binding contract with a college and you have to sign it as a student the parent has to sign it the counselor has to sign it and what we are saying is that we have spoken to the student and that the student understands that if he or she is accepted to the college under an early decision application they will withdraw their applications from all other schools and they will commit to attending that college. So early decision is a really nice option if you absolutely love a school and you know that's where you wanna go and you wanna get that over. 
and know your acceptance. And typically those decisions times fall in the same guidelines as the early action. So you'll often hear your early decisions by your early decision by mid to end of December. Um, but keep in mind that it is a binding ag agreement. So if now, if you decide not to go after your accepted early decision, there's no fine, there's no penalty, they're not going to arrest you or anything like that. But they are very strict about these. They do communicate with other colleges and you certainly would not be able to say, I want to think about it for longer. You would not be able to attend that college. So it is a decision that has to be made very carefully. Um, we do find that some of our more competitive schools, it is slightly easier to be accepted as an early decision candidate um, simply because fewer kids apply. So your chances of getting accepted are greater. Also, more and more colleges are accepting a larger percentage of their freshman class through the early decision avenue. And the reason that is, is that it's a guaranteed acceptance and, and enrollment for the colleges. So colleges get their rankings based on something that's called the yield. And the yield is calculated based on the number of students who are accepted versus the number of students who actually attend the school. And so early decision guarantees the colleges that are going, that you're going to attend them. So it helps their yield. So that is the benefit and the purpose of early decision. Some colleges have moved to early decision one and then an early decision two date, which tends to be in January. So if you don't get into your first choice, you can apply to another school under an early decision two date. You can only apply to one early decision school. You cannot do more than one school as an early decision candidate. Whereas most schools, there are some exceptions, but you can do it several early action deadlines. And then finally, we have what's called open enrollment. These tend to be our community colleges and our trade schools. And these are schools that as long as you apply, if you complete the application, you apply, you will be accepted and they roll all the way through the summer um, for students' acceptance. Two right. questions for you, Ms. Cohen. Go ahead. The first one, do dual enrollment students send both high school and college transcripts with their application? Yes. So for a dual enrollment student, the actual course of the at the college will be on our high school transcript. So if you take a course at Arcadia and it's called criminal justice, it will say on your Cheltenham High School transcript, summer 24, Arcadia University, criminal justice, and then the grade and the credits earned. Um, that is often enough for colleges. Some colleges, however, want you to submit the transcript directly from Arcadia. So you will have to look at what they are expecting and decide if you need to, which way they need you to go. Some of them are fine with it coming right from our transcript. Others want a transcript directly from the university that you did as a dual enrollment student. Second question, what yeah. if you are accepted early decision, but the financial aid is not sufficient? So great question. If the financial aid is not sufficient, um, again, you can back out of it but they do give you an opportunity as you're applying as an early decision candidate to get a rough idea of the financial package that you will get. And I will talk about that a little bit later. So they kind of do expect that you will go into this eyes wide open, knowing what the financial will look like. You can certainly back out of it. And again, nothing's going to happen other than you, you will not be allowed, able to attend that college. Okay, great questions. All right, so what should you be working on now? So the essay is really important um, and it's probably the hardest essay your child is ever going to write. Hopefully if they have already had English first semester, they have worked on that essay already. And if they have English this semester, they're going to be working on it during the fourth marking period. Um, our 12th grade English teachers, if you do have English the first semester, we'll, we'll continue working on that. And if not, there will be opportunities during lunch and learn for you to go and work on the essay. But you really want to make, if you have English this semester and haven't started it yet, make it a priority to, to take your time and really focus on this assignment. Um, 
you want to make sure you are sticking within the guidelines of what the essay requirement is. So if you're applying via Common App, it's 250 to 650 words. You certainly don't want to send an essay of 100 words, and you certainly don't want to send an essay of 1,000 words. You need to be making sure you're answering the specific question. Um, and on the Common App, you can Google Common App prompts. There are five, I think, five or six different options that you can write about. But they all tend to be along the same theme, something you have learned or as demonstrating growth or a challenge you've had to overcome as a high school student. So you want to really spend some time. You want to try to make these not very cliche. So colleges have reported that they have seen so many essays about how my soccer team won the championship game or my, you know, my summer vacation trip to Costa Rica where I volunteered was life-changing or my grandfather is my hero. Um, so you really want to make sure you're working on something creative that's going to grab the, uh, the reader's attention, but it also needs to tell who you are as a person. Um, college reps are very well trained and they can tell if an essay has been too polished and too revised by an adult. Um, at, or by an AI chat. So you want to make sure you're, you're, this is your voice and your essay. Um, you want to, obviously it goes without saying, use spell check, use grammar check. It's, it's important that you do have several other sets of eyes on it, whether it's a teacher or a parent or a counselor, but it does need to ultimately be in your voice. So that sounds very daunting and it can be. Um, you can write about anything you want. I have, over the years, read several phenomenal essays that if I when I tell you the topics, you're going to think it was absolutely a ridiculous topic, but the essays were amazing. So one of them was about how a girl would make every Sunday would make tuna fish sandwiches with her mom. And it's like, again, okay, with making lunch with your mom, what's a big deal? But the way she wrote it really delved into her personality and her relationships and so forth. Um, another student recently, I read an essay, wrote um, an essay using the Wordle basis. So she talked about how she played Wordle and she each section of her essay was the next word in her guessing of this and the words related to her life. I mean, again, Wordle, but it was great. So really definitely spend the time and some effort in the essay writing. Um, you could be working on a resume. Uh, at the very least, you should be brainstorming with your parents all of the activities that you have done from ninth grade through 12th grade, anticipated 12th grade. Colleges don't care about middle school or elementary school unless it's something that you've continued. So if you've taken piano lessons for 15 years, you can include that. But if you played in the middle school orchestra and you did not pick it up back in high school, you should not include that. Um, if you have a large number of activities, Putting together a resume is really impressive for the colleges. You can always upload those. Some of the schools give you a space to upload that. If not, you can email them. Naviance does have a resume builder that you can use to work on. Um, if As you start brainstorming, you want to start thinking about what your role was, how what your time commitment in it was, and what the years, the experience, and what you actually did in that activity. Letters of recommendation. You also have to start thinking about college recommendations. So many colleges are looking for two to three recommendations from teachers. So who should you ask? You want to try to think about first, first group of people you should consider is your 11th grade teachers. Are there any 11th grade teachers that you had th this year that you think would write you a really strong letter of recommendation? If so, before the end of the year, you should speak to them. You should ask them if they would be willing to write you one. Um, they'll probably say, yep, touch base with me in the fall, and that's what you'll do, but at least you'll be on their radar. Uh, it does not have to be a class that you had straight A's in, um, because sometimes an easy class that you get straight A's in, but you're just sitting there, you're doing your work, you're not, you know, you're not really involved or invested, you're not going to get a great letter from that teacher. But if it's a class that you had like a B and a C in, and you went to the teacher for lunch and learn, and you participated, and you were always prepared, and you were active in group work, that's going to be a really good letter of recommendation, even if you ultimately ended with a C in the class. So really start to think about who you would use for your junior year. Um, if you know for sure that you're going to be a 
science major or engineering, you want to try to, if possible, pick a science teacher or a math teacher or someone that would fit into the major that you're interested in. Um, now, you might not really think you clicked or gelled with any of your 11th grade teachers. So then go back to 10th grade. But really, unless you had a ninth grade teacher that was just above and beyond, and maybe you continued that relationship with them, I wouldn't go back much further than 10th grade. So that's what you're trying to think about. Um, in addition to your two or three teachers, you can also ask one coach um, or sponsor of an activity or an employer where you've worked. They can include a letter of recommendation also, but they really do want to mainly hear from your teachers. Um, again, I would encourage you to speak to your teachers at the end of this year, just so that they're on you're on their radar when it comes time to actually asking them and submitting the request in the fall. And then finally, it's a good time to complete your testing, your SAT and ACT testing. If you haven't done so, um, hopefully many of you took the test that just occurred in March. Um, keep in mind that we are now all digital testing. So here are the remaining test dates that are left. We are a test site here in June. We are not in May for the SAT. Um, and then we're anticipating dates. These are these haven't been confirmed by the College Board, but following previous patterns, this is what most people think. The dates are going to be August 24th, October 5th, November 2nd, December 7th. So August and October are absolutely appropriate for testing for you as a senior. Um, November and December gets a little bit late, especially if you're going to be doing any early action. If you're not doing any early action and your schools are um, regular decisions, November test and even the December test would be plenty of time. All right. And then in the fall, we are typically hosting an October and December dates, not the August or the November date. If you're interested in the ACT, below are the dates here. Um, and keep in mind that we are not a test site. Uh, one thing now that you're starting to come up with you some schools that you're interested in, when you take the SAT and when you register for the SAT, you can select four colleges to receive your scores for free. So if you know for sure that you're going to be applying to a specific school, send them the SAT score. If you indicate on your application that you're not going to use them, they won't download them. But if you are going to use them, then you have them for free. Otherwise, in the fall, you're going to be paying, I think it's like $13 a school to send these SATs for. All if right. A so, go ahead. takes a college course that they have already taken at Sheltonham, but they earn a higher grade in the college course, for example, can you replace high school biology for a college biology? No, you cannot replace it on your transcript, but both would be on your transcript. And the college level course would be seen as a college level course, whereas the, the biology from Cheltenham is obviously a high school level course. So it's not really going to work too badly in against you, but you cannot replace the course. It will, um, both of them appear on the transcript as of right now. All right, what can I be doing now? So between now and the summer, as we talked about, visit the schools. Start thinking about some financial aid options and I'm gonna show you what you can be doing, moms and dads, for that one. Uh, you're, you're, scared, you're finish off your testing. Um, start thinking about your online applications. The common application is available now. You just want to make sure if you just do start that, that you're doing it for the 24-25 school year. And that, that is a designation into Common App. Work on that essay. Um, if a college requires a counselor recommendation, we do have a survey that we ask you to fill out for us. So college counselor recommendations are slightly different than teachers. Teachers are going to focus on you as a student in their classroom. Whereas we write recommendations as a more of a general um, observation and general, like all facets of you from personality to work ethics, to school grades, to activities and so forth. Um, so you can start doing that survey now and it's on your on Naviance again, you'll just click on the circle with your initials, click on surveys and there it will be. And then you want to clean up your social media. So Please be aware that more and more colleges are enlisting 
people and or programs to check a student's social media. So obviously the larger schools, the Penn States, the Pittsburghs, the um, Maryland's are not going to have the time or the, the ability to do that. But if you're looking at smaller schools, you, there's a good chance that they will be looking at your social media. So you want to make sure that there's nothing on there that's inappropriate, doesn't have you surrounded by red solo cups, doesn't have you in a cloud of, of smoke, doesn't have you cursing and using foul language. So really make sure that you are presenting yourself in your best light in social media, even if it is on lockdown and you are private mode, please be aware that there are programs that they can use to get around that. So really take a hard look at that. You want to come back to high school in September, having done all of these and more you can do now, the better off you're going to be. So if you can complete your common application over the summer, you can write your essay over the summer, you trust me are going to be so much happier as a senior. So senior year, what should you be doing? Um, we will have a college application night. Typically it's held six o'clock, then right before back to school night. Back to school night tends to be at se start at seven. So this would start at six. This is essential for parents because this is how we are going to, we're going to teach you how to request transcripts, how to request letters of recommendation, how to send applications, all that thing. Senior year in the fall, you should be committing, completing and submitting your applications. Again, we would like you to have all applications done by September, October, if possible. Um, if you have to test in the fall, there are still a few dates you can do that. You are going to go back to your teachers that you talked to junior year, and you're going to follow up with them about the recommendations. You're going to sign up for the college representative nights. Um, parents, we offer two options for financial information. Um, keep an eye on dates. They have not been scheduled yet. But the first is a financial aid night that we will go through the process with you. And we have a financial aid representative from a local college that comes and actually does the presentation and talks about what you your role is and what your student's role is and how to actually do the application. And then we also offer a FAFSA completion night. So that is a time for you to bring all of your tax information, all of your bank accounts, and actually sit in the high school and someone from the Pennsylvania Higher Education um, Association for Financial Aid will be here to help you submit your actual application. So keep an eye out for those dates. Um, up, seek and apply for scholarships. So this is done in your senior year after you do your applications, we typically recommend. If you are an athlete, you kind of have two paths that you're following. One is the college path. The other is the NCAA because you have to clear and get approval by the NCAA to participate as a division one or a division two athlete. Um, you need to send your transcripts and testing scores directly to them. So you should be in touch with your counselor and we can help you through that. And then finally, you should be submitting your FAFSA, which I will get into now. So question, financially, Ms. Cohen, go ahead. First question. Can yep. you send SAT scores to a school, but opt out of attaching them to an application? Yes. Okay. So you can send a score and on the application, it will ask if you are going to be submitting your SAT scores. If you say no, they will not download the score into your account. Okay. Second question. Can you explain again, what is meant by sending official score reports? So many colleges are wanting the SAT scores sent directly from college board, and that's considered an official score report. So it would have to be sent directly from college board as opposed to you entering the scores that you earned. Okay, great questions, guys. Thank you. All right, so financial aid. There's two types of financial aid, merit versus need. Merit is everybody's favorite because merit is money that you don't need to pay back. These come in the form of grants and awards and scholarships. And this is often based on um, your high school performance or your extracurricular involvement or random different I things that colleges will just award you money. So that's what everybody hopes to get. Need-based financial aid is money that is based on your, and, and merit money is awarded completely 
irregardless of what um, these family income is. Need-based is financial aid that is awarded based on family income. Need-based can also be in the, in the form of scholarships and grants that do not need to be paid back. Um, but more typically, need-based aid is in the form of student loans and parent loans. Um, in order to qualify for need-based loans, you have to complete some financial aid paperwork. And this is for parents. The first one is called the FAFSA. It stands for Free Application for Federal Student Aid. That is something that all students who want to be considered for need-based aid, whether it is um, money you have to pay back or not, you must complete. Um, you fill out this paperwork. You will upload your tax information from 2023, because you're the class of 25. So, and that money is then, that's a finance, it's a federal form. It's free. So do not pay, ever pay to fill that form out. That form is then sent to the federal government. They will then determine an amount that they deem is appropriate for you to pay towards college. And then they send that data to the individual colleges. And then the colleges are responsible for putting together a financial aid package in the form of um, grant money, loan money, work study money. So that's how that process works. Many colleges, especially the private schools, also require a financial aid form called the CSS profile. That is run by college board. And unfortunately, there is a fee to apply using the profile application. So make sure your college actually requires it before you submit that form. So there's something every college is required to have on their website called the net price calculator. So you can Google Drexel University net price calculator. You enter your information, your financial information, your tax information from 2023, you would enter, um, you know, whatever, all kinds of questions that they ask you, including your students' GPA and SAT scores, if they have them, and they will give you a rough idea of what the financial aid package from their college will look like. So it is a good tool to start playing around with, especially if you are doing early decision. As we talked about, the net price calculator is strongly encouraged to make sure that you're in the ballpark of what, what you're going to be able to afford. And then there are scholarships. So the majority of financial aid money comes from the college of themselves, from the FAFSA or the merit money that the college deems that they're going to give you. However, there are random scholarship searches um, that you can utilize to try to find additional money. Um, Naviance always has a list of them. Sometimes your employers will have them, some service organizations. You can just do some Googling of scholarship searches, and there are some search engines out there that you will fill out questionnaires, and you would be surprised at the types of scholarships that are available. Left-handed people, um, for twins, for people who are first-generation college students, for people who are from an Irish background, lots of opportunities for scholarships that are out there. You should never pay for a scholarship search that or an opportunity. They, they tend to be scams. Um, you can gather all that information online. But the FAFSA is the big one. So completing the FAFSA, um, I'm going to start this by saying this year, the federal government redid the FAFSA and it was a nightmare. Um, it was supposed to have opened October 1st. It didn't open until January. And even then it was a soft opening. Um, and I don't know if you followed any of the news or if any of you have senior students, but the federal government then delayed getting the information, the data to the colleges until mid-March. So the colleges actually probably are just starting to receive if they have received them already. And so it has pushed back the college's ability to give financial aid packages and awards. Um, many colleges have pushed back their deadlines for when they want their, their deposits in because of this. So I am putting all of this out here with a caveat that I have no idea, that nobody has any idea of what the timeline will look like for the FAFSA for the 25-26 school year, which is what you will be filling in. Um, as I said, in previous years, they try to get it to, available to families after October 1st, but this year they were not able to, so we are not sure what's going to happen for, for your year. 
Um, but keep in mind that your the FAFSA you will be filling out will be doing the 2023 income information. Um, and financial aid night will be in the fall. And then hopefully by then we will have more deadlines and details as to when the government will have all of this information available. Um, this is another case of you should be filing early and watch for deadlines because once the money's been given out, there is no money left for you. So if the deadline is, or is I don't know, say November 15th, definitely try to get it in September, October, or October after the FAFSA opens as soon as you possibly can will work in your advantage. One question. Yep. If your student would like to apply to a school August 1st, is there summer support for students to get help with recommend recommendations and et cetera? So we at the school are not able to send transcripts out of, so one of the components of the college application is many colleges require a an official high school transcript. That means it has to come directly from the high school. We do not have the ability to do that until two weeks into the start of the school year because we need to make sure that everything is accurate on them and that any summer school work and dual enrollment work has been included on the transcript. So there is a two week time period by the time school starts that they are not available. Typically it's the middle of September. However, there are many schools that do what's called self-reporting. Um, for instance, I mentioned you, University of Pittsburgh. University of Pittsburgh, you will enter your grades your, yourself. So you will send the application, you will enter your grades from 9th, 10th, 11th grade, the classes you're taking in 12th grade, you will enter your SAT scores if appropriate. They do not require letters of recommendation. And so Pittsburgh and other schools like that are able to make a decision prior to school starting. But if your school requires a transcript sent from the high school and they require letters of recommendation, they will not be available in August. That's not done until the middle of September. All right, here are some really good scholarship websites that we have found, um, ways that you can look for scholarships, ways you can get on some search engines and so forth. So nice ones to take a look at. And this, um, Presentation will be posted on the website, both the video of it and the PowerPoint itself. So you can go back and review this later. So don't feel like you have to quickly write it down or take a picture. All right, so stay in touch, especially if this is your first child going through college. It's a very, very different process from when we went to school. So, and it can be very daunting. Um, it can be very overwhelming for both the students and the parents. So please, please use your counselor to help navigate this. Um, I can tell you from both personal experience and from experience as a counselor, it can become very tense in the house with the applications and deadlines and you want them to do it and they don't want to do it. They want to be out with their friends. So utilize your counselor, stay in touch with your counselor, um, email them. If you would rather come in and meet with us, we'd be glad to do that. Many of our information that we send home is sent home with Jimmy DeAndrea's Sunday message. So you can always access counseling information from there. Also, make sure you are logging on to Naviance um, that, you that you are going on, as we talked about at the beginning of this, and putting your email down so you can receive emails as well. We send many, many emails to students with information about the college visits, the college representatives, college application deadlines, um, financial aid nights, um, scholarship opportunities. So make sure you're avail you're getting Naviance emails from us. Uh, you should have received several. I think I sent at least one a week for the last few weeks. So if you did receive an email from me about tonight, you are signed up for Naviance emails, just so you know. All right, so some important dates for your senior year. As I said, in September, whenever back to school night is determined, we will have an evening that night. October, we typically do a financial aid process. And then depending on when the FAFSA is available, uh, we, we like to do it in November. This year, we had to push it off to February just because of the, the problems with FAFSA. But we will have that night for you to come in and actually get assistance completing the financial aid form itself. All right, a lot of information in an hour. I know Mr. 
Brian has given you good answers, um, but here's a chance right now. You can ask questions. Any questions you might have, we can answer right now. If you don't have any specific questions, we wanna thank you for joining us tonight. We want to, we know it's a very overwhelming time. So hopefully this eased your mind a little bit and gave you some good information. We're going to hang on. Mr. Brian and I will hang on for a minute to see if there are any other questions that come up. If not, you are welcome to, to exit the presentation. All right, our numbers are dropping. We'll hang on for another minute or so. Thank you so much for joining us. We're, we hope that this was helpful and you have a great night. Um, can Eastern be added as an AP class? So Eastern is not added as an AP class, no. Um, however, if you do the Allied Health Program, you get credit for that as an honors level course. Okay, we'll... A few more minutes. Any last minute questions? Well, have a wonderful evening. Thanks for joining us and um, good luck with the search.